Hi, welcome to our presentation of the possibilities. Uh, today we'll be, we will be discussing our point of sale software and their insecurities. So my name is Anthony Sassadus. I work as a security researcher at Versprite. And currently I'm interested in hardware security, reverse engineering, uh, communication protocols, and vulnerability research. Yeah, my name is uh, Fabius. I also work for Versprite as a security researcher. And I'm interested in reverse engineering, vulnerability research, and exploit dev. And first off, we're, we're both noobs at this. Uh, this is both of our first uh, real research gig. And uh, this was our first research project. Um, we were tasked with uh, point of sale research basically because of its large scope. It will give us the freedom to poke and prod and uh, actually get creative with it. Yeah, as Anthony said, we're, we're both new to this. This is our first presentation. So we have to kind of figure out which tools, resources, and techniques work for us throughout this uh, project. So I'm sure everybody here knows what a point of sale system is. It's, very, it's ubiquitous in daily life. We use them uh, every day, whether we're going to the grocery store, whether we're uh, booking a hotel room. Yeah, so uh, at the beginning of our research, we investigated uh, some of the high profile uh, security breaches that happened. And uh, we noticed that a lot of them were due to point of sale insecurities. Early, earlier this year, uh, an Applebee's franchisee by the name of uh, RMH Holdings suffered a security breach in which they discovered POS malware on their security systems. And uh, late last year, Forever 21 also discovered uh, some point of sale malware that had been on their systems for about seven months before it was detected. And we, and we thought looking at malware would be actually a good place to start. Um, so we decided to uh, download uh, different families of malware, actually reverse engineer them, and understand what kind of capabilities they were um, actually using. So we're going to talk a little bit about POS malware. So point of sale malware isn't very different from your traditional malware. The primary difference is their objective. Point of sale malware has the uh, sole objective of stealing your credit card information. Now they get in your system the same way as traditional malware through phishing or brute force attacks. However, as I mentioned, they're just, they just want your credit card data. So like Fabius said, uh, the main goal of this malware is to get your track data, your credit card data. And this is a formalized standard from the International Standards Organization. So the criminals already know what format this data takes. And they're able to use this knowledge to parse it and uh, extract your primary account number, your cardholder name, expiration date, your security code, everything they would need to actually make purchases under your, under your account. So the attack surface for point of sale malware is sort of familiar to what we usually see. Most of the point of sale applications that we saw are supported by the Windows platform. We also discovered something called Windows POS rating, which we didn't know about before we started this project, uh, which is a POS focus uh, Windows distribution. Uh, a lot of the applications are also supported on Linux or Mac. However, these are much less common than the uh, Windows supported applications. Now, there are a few big players in this space, um, namely uh, Oracle and NCR, but there are a lot of small guys. It's a very diverse landscape. When we looked at it, there are over 3,000 applications, and this makes it very difficult to verify each and every one to make sure that they're doing things securely. So we're gonna start talking about some point of sale malware. The first one we're gonna talk about is Black POS. Black POS at its core is a command line utility for scraping the process memory of, uh, for track data. As a bundled Trojan, Black POS includes exfiltration methods at, such as email and FTP. And uh, Black POS was actually discovered during the forensic analysis of the target breach in 2013. Next, we'll discuss uh, Dexter. Um, what make Dexter unique uh, with, between, uh, in, uh, <coughs> instead of the other pieces of malware that we looked at, is its RAM scraper actually utilized a byte-wise byte scraping algorithm, which made it more efficient. Um, the other malware families used uh, regular expressions. Um, this also dumped, uh, dropped a key logging library, which if the data wasn't swiped, if it was just pressed in to a, key, to a keypad, it would actually capture that too. Um, the, leaked, the source was also leaked online, which newer variants of malware actually took and incorporated some of their capabilities. So we're gonna talk about Magic POS. It gets its name from the Magic panel, which you can uh, see here. The attackers actually choose a network range and scan them for VNC and RDP services and attempt to authenticate to them with uh, a brute force attack. After they authenticate, they install the malware, which is a, a .NET application, and then access its capabilities through the magic panel. 
We also looked at something called UDPOS. Uh, what made UDPOS unique is that it masqueraded as a legitimate program. This le legitimate program was Log Me In. It's a secure remote desktop software. Um, it also incorporated some anti-analysis uh, functionality, which if it was installed in a virtual machine or detected antivirus, it would limit its capabilities. And uh, the last piece of uh, point of cell malware that we're going to talk about is PinkKite. PinkKite is relatively new. I believe it was discovered in March of 2018. It's a successor of the Baden uh, malware family. It's really small at six kilobytes. It kills itself after 12 hours. It's sort of a quick and dirty POS malware just to steal card information and remove its tracks. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, was one of the more recent variants. So this gives us an idea of where the point of cell malware landscape is. Now, we've talked a lot about little, uh, some of the samples of point of cell malware that we've looked at. Now we want to talk about some of the applications that are affected by these pieces of malware, as well as some of the uh, security problems that we've identified in them. The first point of cell application that we want to talk about is called Possum Evo. Possum Evo is a point of cell and inventory management system. It's uh, written in Java. However, when you actually run Possum Evo, it triggers a C++ launcher that calls the uh, Java code. Its backend is uses a MariaDB, which is a fork of MySQL. And when you install Possum, it bundles its own Java binaries and MySQL client utilities. Since Possum is written in Java, we have to figure out how we want it to reverse engineer Java applications. So Java is a programming language that is capable of running on many different architectures uh, due to its write once run anywhere nature. And the way it does this is by compiling down a bytecode instead of machine code. And we discovered that bytecode's actually uh, possible to decompile into a relatively accurate source code representation. So our tool of choice for this was Bytecode Viewer. Uh, like Fabia says, it allows us to take the, uh, the bytecode and turn it into a source code representation quite easily. And this, is, this makes it uh, easy to look at source code, look at the flow of the program to search for security vulnerabilities and logic bugs. So given the source code representation, uh, we have to sit down and think, how do, what do we want to look for in the data that we have? So the first thing we want to look for in the code is authentication routines, because we want to see if there's any way we can potentially bypass authentication. Next thing we looked at was cryptographic routines to see if there was any keys that we had access to as low priv users or if they were using a weak cryptographic algorithm. Next we want to look at constant fields, which, which are just uh, collections of variables, such as uh, usernames, port numbers, et cetera, that might give us some insight into what to look for during our analysis. And in that regard, we also want to look for any hard-coded credentials that we could possibly use. We wanted to analyze how the model view controller code was set up because we want to see if we can uh, take a graphical, look at the graphical components of the application and understand how its underlying functionality was implemented. We want to look at the use of external dependencies because any issue with the dependency will be inherited by the application. And uh, lastly, we want to look at any network operations, because as we all know, the network attack surface is a very juicy target for attackers. So now we're going to talk about some of the things we found uh, with Possum Evo, or Possum Evo. Our first finding was the use of hard-coded credentials. Um, these were uh, sprinkled throughout the source code decompilation. Uh, we were able to use these credentials to log into uh, the Maria database. Um, with, this, uh, with this capability, we were able to uh, create user-defined functions. Uh, which we were able to use to achieve code execution. Um, one thing to note is that MariaDB is started by the uh, MariaDB Evo service, and that runs as local local system. If we're able to get code execution, we were able to uh, execute code with those privileges. Uh, and here is a demo of us doing that. So first off, we are going to uh, upload uh, the Netcat binary to be later used as a mindshare. <laughs> We upload our shared library, uh, that is uh, UDF, our user defined function. We are going to log into the database. We are going to import the sysexec function from that shared library. Um, and then we use that function to launch Netcat. And here it's going to show us logging into that bind shell. Mm -hmm. We're hitting that bind shell. And we're going to have those privileges, system privileges. Uh, our next finding with Possum Evo was uh, what we call override. So initially when we were looking at this, um, we looked at the logging screen and on, over onto the bottom left corner, we saw an override button. We thought, well, this seems interesting, what does it do? Um, 
You click on override and you find it'll give you an override code, which it then expects you to contact an agent and they'll give you an override key to bypass login. So we investigated. Um, the override code was actually generated pretty quickly and easily, but we weren't interested in this. We were interested in how this is used to generate a real key. So looking at the algorithm to generate the real key, we noticed it wasn't very complex at all. No crypto involved, just um, some basic, basic mathematics. So we thought, let's write a key generator, or at least try to. Um, and that's basically what we did. Uh, we ported the logic over to Python, uh, wrote up a little key generator, and this will basically allow us to bypass all logins. And here's a demo of us showing that on. Here's the login screen. We hit override. We're given an override code. We run our script, input our code that was given, get our key. enter our key and override, and we basically log in without any credentials. And this will basically uh, give you access to actually open cash register or, or whatever. So uh, the final component of Possum that we want to talk about is something regarding the auto update feature. So Possum stores a copy of the installation binary for itself inside of the database. Whenever a Possum is launched, it checks the version of the application that's launched to the version that's in the database. If the versions are equal, Possum launches normally. If the database's version is higher, it'll prompt the user to update their version of Possum to the newer version. And what's interesting is if the database's version is lower than what the user is running, it'll actually upload the user's installation binary to the database. So it'll call uh, DB Backup Git Software State in order to determine the database's installation binary version. And as I mentioned, if the software version that the user is running is newer than the software version that's in the database, it will replace the binary in the database with the one that the user has. Uh, so whenever the user actually launch Possum and it checks to see, or it checks to see if the version is newer or older, and the user decides to update, it'll look in the database for a file called possumevo.exe. So we thought about this and how it was implemented, and uh, given our access to the database from the credentials that we got earlier, we decided to try and exploit this feature by forging an installation binary. So in order to uh, trigger this routine, we have to uh, meet two requirements. The first is that in the database, our binary has to be named possum underscore evo.exe. And secondly, the file version hash, which is where the application gets the database's version number, uh, has to be higher than the version number that the, the client has. So <clears throat> whenever the binary is, uh, is downloaded by the user after they decide to update, Possum just triggers that executable and launches it. So as I mentioned, we're going to use the credentials that we got previously that's hard coded into, into the application to log into the database, create a binary that's uh, to be used for installation, and trigger the auto update feature. Here's a demo of that in action. So first we log into the database server, and then we uh, switch over to the Possum database context. After that, what we want to do is we want to get the actual version number that's stored in the database. And you can see here it's 1.15.5. We want to update that so that it's newer than what the client would be running. So we're going to change it to 1.15.6. And then we're going to upload a binary to the server, and we're going to name it possum underscore evil.exe. Whenever um, that's uploaded with the newer version, after the user actually launches the application, skip ahead here a little bit. It prompts the user to update. It'll say, hey, do you want to update from 15.5 to 15.6? After the user clicks uh, download update, it'll download it and execute it. And the binary we uploaded is a calculator application. So instead of actually launching Possum, it launches calculator instead. <clears throat> so our next uh, point of sale system that we'll be speaking on is uh, Amigo POS. Um, this is ba basically, basically used in the hospitality industry. This was a little different than uh, Possum as it was written in the .NET framework, and it also used SQL Server Express as its backend. So Amigo comes bundled with several different applications. One of the interesting ones we looked at was uh, called the back office application. Uh, so through some black box testing of this application, we discovered that it accepts some interesting command line arguments 
And uh, two of them are particularly, particularly interesting. The first one is temp user. If you run back office with a temp user argument, it'll just create an administrative temporary user for you that you can use to log into the POS application or into the back office component of the application and perform administrative tasks. The more interesting uh, argument is the DB argument. Uh, as you can see in this picture here, it gives you access to the SQL settings, allows you to modify and delete uh, database entries, and most, interest, most interestingly, it gives you access to a SQL query window where you can just run SQL statements. So for those of you who are familiar with uh, MS SQL or SQL Server Express, there's something called XT Command Shell that allows you to run commands. Whenever Amigo POS is installed, it actually uh, installs its local system. Uh, its database is installed as local system. Which is interesting because if you do a standalone install, typically the privilege level is lower than that. So that was a choice made by the Amigo developers. So as I said, we're going to use the XP command shell procedure to actually run commands. And because it's uh, installed as local system, we can use the SQL query window to actually run system commands through SQL. Here's the demonstration. So we just click on the SQL query window. First, we have to enable XP command shell because in a lot of settings, it's disabled by default. But due to our privilege level within the database, we can easily re-enable it. After we enable it, we can uh, run XP command shell. And uh, we're just going to call netcat to uh, start up a, a bind shell on port 4444. And then we're going to click run query. After that, we're going to open up a command prompt and then use netcat to connect to the local host on that same port which should give us access to a system <coughs> shell. So the next uh, application we want to talk about is called AccuPOS. AccuPOS is another point of sale and inventory management system. It also includes uh, time clock uh, options for employees to clock in and clock out. It's written in Java, so we're going to take uh, sort of the same approach we did with Possum. And its database backend is actually in the cloud, so we didn't touch that because I was strictly out of scope for the sake of our research. So reversing IQPOS is very similar to Possum, as I mentioned. We just used Bytecode Viewer to decompile the application and took some of the same approaches that we discussed earlier when looking at it. However, a lot of that didn't work. It took us a, a little bit longer to actually find anything interesting inside of IQPOS. Uh, we had to think outside of the box. So yeah, we, we couldn't find anything initially, so we kind of had to get cr creative in how we were looking. Um, we had to take a, a brand new approach, basically. And now I'm going to uh, run through some of the rabbit holes we fell through and uh, what we were trying to do. So first off, we noticed um, there was a Java key store installed with uh, Aggie POS. Uh, now, we, alongside that, we found, uh, using static analysis, that the password for this key store was uh, basically put in there hard-coded. Uh, so we tried to extract the contents. We were able to do that. We got a certificate. We got a key material. And we tried to basically uh, decrypt the communication traffic going to the cloud. Uh, we tried to do it, uh, but we failed. So what next? Uh, we, looked, we wanted to look at the network attack surface. Now we did notice that uh, the Java uh, process was listening on a port. So we wanted to look at the code and look at uh, what, what was actually it doing and how was it using it. Um, we found it being used in a just one instance class. And this basically only um, checked to see if there was something listening on port 12345. If there was, it would assume it's AccuPOS and it wouldn't launch another process. And this basically got us nowhere also. Next, we wanted to look at uh, file permissions what file permissions were given to AccuPOS in the folder it was installed. Uh, we used a utility called iCackles that is bundled with Windows, uh, and it revealed that uh, all authenticated users are provided with modified access, um, and uh, we figured that we could actually backdoor this binary. So we did some research and we considered that a win. <clears throat> so given that we're able to essentially modify a jar file, we came up with something called jar jacking. A uh, jar file, for those of you who don't know, is basically a zip archive, and they contain the class file as well as other resources for the application. The class files actually contain the code, so our ability to modify this file allows us to essentially reprogram the application. And we decided to look more into jar jacking from a post-exploitation perspective. And this led us to the idea to develop a Java implant that we wanted to put into the jar file. So an implant is basically a covert piece of software that gives someone access to defined capabilities. 
Some of the basic capabilities that might exist are push and pull and exec, which allow for file transfer and code or command execution. And this led us to the creation of something called Runaway Reptar. So we decided to build our own framework for this. Uh, we wanted to actually emulate what a real attack or a real criminal organization would actually do and what that would look like. Um, so Runaway Reptar is our framework. It's basically an infector, an implant, and a command control server or a C2. Um, our attack plan was basically inject our implant code into the application jar from a low privilege context, modify the class in the jar to actually launch our implant, demonstrate capabilities that we want, like uh, you know being able to grab our credit card data, you know exfil it and whatnot, and you know make some money, right? Of course. <laughs> it's actually a joke. We reported all the things that we found to the vendors. And uh, some of them responded appropriately, but they, they got all the information they needed in regards to anything that we discovered. So our basic architecture for Runway Reptile was um, the infected was written in Ruby as a uh, post-exploitation module. Uh, we used uh, Java for the implant with a little bit of uh, C++ that leveraged JNA, and also Python uh, for the command and control server uh, with uh, Flask framework. So the C2 that we designed to use the SQLite for a database backend has a web interface that you see here for operators to actually operate on the implants. And it includes web endpoints, so you can't see that the implant actually communicates back to and responds to any commands. Uh, in order for the implant to even communicate to the C2, it has to be registered. Prior to registration, a client can't really communicate to the C2, it just responds with an empty response. And uh, the way uh, an implant is registered with the C2 is through the infector, which provides the C2 with information such as a GUID, a registration key to be used for cryptography, and a copy of the original jar file uh, for future disinfection. After uh, an implant is uh, registered with the C2, it then is able to authenticate. It does this by uh, sending a packet, authentication packet that's encrypted with the registration key, and uh, all of the C2 packet data is basically foreign encoded uh, prior to being encrypted. Next, we're going to talk about the design of the implant that we made. It follows the singleton design pattern, which prevents one, more than one instance of the implant from running at once. All of the classes uh, that the implant uses are threaded, which prevents the implant from affecting the POS application's uh, functionality in any way. And all the commands were chosen to demonstrate realistic attackers. So. Uh, uh, this is based on a lot of stuff that we talked about earlier regarding the POS malware that we investigated. And the primary thing that we wanted to emulate and improve upon was the uh, RAM scraping implementation. Now, it's worth mentioning that our RAM scraper is dif different from the RAM scraper that a lot of malware we looked at uses uh, because ours is much more uh, targeted. We are implanted inside of the Java application. We share the same Java heap, so we can form a much targeted RAM scraper because, uh, we, uh, because we share that heap and we know where the track data is being stored as Java objects. Now, in, in order to do everything we wanted to accomplish, we had to learn a lot about low-level Java. Um, in particular, we had to learn how to use the unsafe class in order to leak an address that's on the JVM heap. Uh, we also had to learn of how Java represents pointers um, using object ordinary pointers or compressed oops. And also we had to learn how to use Java native access uh, to leverage uh, some C for our RAM scraping code. Um, so first off, we wanted to leak an address on the JVM heap. Um, we could use unsafe for this, uh, but it's usually used as uh, for Java internal use only. Um, we are able to use this by jumping through some hoops by using reflection, and we are given access to the methods. Also what was important for us is, because we wanted to be cross-platform, we wanted to be able to run on 32-bit systems and 64-bit systems and leak an address, we had to understand when and where it would give us back uh, a native pointer or what, when it would compress that pointer where we actually had to factor it back and do some uh, manipulation on it to actually get a correct address. <coughs> And also, uh, we wanted to use uh, Java Native Access to leverage C code. Um, we decided on C code because uh, the Win32 uh, API has uh, very powerful um, process memory functionality uh, included in it. Um, but in order to do this, we had to take a few steps uh, to actually set up the process to be able to uh, get the JVM heap 
to send it to our native side. First, we had to uh, get the process ID of the Java process that we we're actually living in, um, obtain a handle to that process, query the information about the memory region that we we're interested in, and then finally uh, copy that uh, memory region, which is the JVM heap, to a buffer. And then we basically take that buffer we have, pass it to the JNA side to our C code, and then you know scan for track data. And uh, basically, our track search. Uh, fully written in C, uh, basically was modeled after uh, what Dexter did, um, a bite-wise track search, uh, except, like we said, our method was more targeted than their approach. So next we're going to talk about the vector component of Runaway Reptar. So initially when we were playing around with modifying jar files, we are using a jar archive tool, which is included with the uh, Java development kit. However, it was limited, it didn't have the functionality that we actually needed. So we actually use our vector to perform any uh, jar jacking. Now in order for uh, the vector to be built, we used uh, Ruby and built it with Metasploit as a post exploitation module. The way it works is it actually uh, picks a class within the jar file and replaces it with a modified version that triggers our implet code as well as uh, perform its original operation. In order to choose an ideal uh, target class to inject, it had to meet two requirements. The first one is it has to be launched relatively soon that our so that our implant is launched soon. And secondly, it needs to be able to be re-implemented with accuracy because we didn't want to change the functionality of the actual application. So when the infector is initialized, uh, the operator is able to set four uh, different options, C2 host and C2 port, callback, which uh, determines how often the implant actually calls back to the C2, and jar pad, which uh, is used to change the target jar path in case the application isn't installed in the default location. So whenever the infector begins, it first generates a key to be used for communication, initial communication, uh, to the C2. Uh, the infector also patches the implant class. So whenever I compiled the actual implant class, I included these hard-coded uh, values as integers in the binary, and I replaced them with the values that the operator provides uh, through Metasploit for C2 host, C2 port, and callback, so that I have a sort of a modular implant component. After this happens, the infector actually registers the implant on behalf of the target host to the C2. And uh, it does this by sending the GUID, the key, and the original jar file uh, to the C2 through a post request to the registration endpoint. Next, all of the resources are bundled into a copy of the original jar. All of the DLL resources needed for JNA, as well as the class files needed for the implant are added to this uh, jar copy. And all of the class files are actually modified to include the version number of the target system so that it's compatible with the version of Java that's running on that system. And lastly, the infected copy of the jar file is copied over the target's application jar file, uh, completing the process of the infector. And uh, any subsequent launches of the application will launch our implant code. Uh, and this is the completion of the runaway Reptar infection process, and I'm going to demonstrate that here. So first I want to show you guys uh, the original state of the AccuPost jar. You can see it's uh, 331 megabytes approximately, and the SHA-256 starts with 0711. Uh, we'll go over to the attacker machine to show the infection process. So I'm going to just set some uh, options inside of Metasploit and launch the infector. After that's complete, Runaway Reptar has started. You can see that the AccuPOS jar file has changed as a completely different hash and now it's approximately 380 megabytes. <clears throat> so this is the Runaway Reptar C2 interface. This is where the operator will perform all their C2 tasks. And this is the, actually the implant list. Uh, right now we just have this target. You can see there's a JavaScript command line interface for anyone to type in commands. I'll just type in who am I to demonstrate that, uh, as well as uh, IP config to show the network settings. Uh, next I want to demonstrate the, uh, the push capability, which is to upload a file to the target. We're just going to upload the host file, as an example, to the target desktop. <coughs> Mind any... Uh, don't mind any typos in this demonstration. 
So as you can see on the desktop, there's a host file. And uh, if we open it up, it'll have the contents of the host file that our C2 has. <coughs> Following this, I want to show pulling a file from the target. Uh, we're just going to pull win.ini, it's a common file on Windows systems. And I have this uh, loot button, which actually takes us to the loot page. Now, the way the loot page works is it identifies the, the target based on the machine GUID. So if the implant's restarted and has a different registration code, that doesn't matter because uh, the loot is based on GUID and all the files pulled for that system will be in this folder. We click on this and download it. I'm just going to open it with uh, Vim and show that uh, these are the contents of the target's win INI file. Next, we're going to show the more interesting uh, component, which is the CC dump. So there's this dump file page, which is empty originally because there's nothing dumped. However, um, as things are added, they'll be added to this page. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over to the uh, go over to the target machine, run AccuPOS, and uh, log in. And we're just going to buy uh, Meatball Sub, which is about five bucks, which is a fair price, I'd say. <laughs> Uh, we're going to enter our credit card number, which is the Visa, one of Visa's test numbers, and uh, random expiration date, and click process card. Now we're given this error code because it's not actually set up to the back end to actually work. However, the application at this point has loaded the card information into the uh, process, so it's in the Java heap. So our CC dump will still work. We click CC dump, and then we go over to uh, dump file, and uh, after refresh, we can see the test card number that was loaded into the Java process. Next we're going to show you the, in the persistence uh, component of Runaway Reptar. So the way it works is it actually uploads a file to uh, attacker-defined location and then creates a registry key that uh, actually uh, copies the persistence file over the application binary. You can see here it's 380 megabytes, just as was the, uh, the infected version of the jar file. And if we open the registry editor, you can see this RR key in the registry, which has the command to copy the file over. Now after uh, persistence is enabled, you'll see this persistence true turns green. Uh, at this point, we're just going to demonstrate cleaning up. So first, we're going to disable persistence. And then, as we know, we uh, copy the file over to the desktop. We want to remove that file. So we're just going to run dir on the uh, desktop path, and then delete that host file that we uploaded earlier. <coughs> Next, we're going to actually verify that that has been deleted. As you can see here, it's, uh, it's not there anymore. So then we're going to clear the command queue so that no more commands are loaded. And we're going to click disinfect. Whenever a disinfection is uh, complete, it will actually remove itself from this implant list. And um, here we're going to go back over to the target machine and show you that the original jar file has been uh, recovered from the C2 uh, database. And you can see here it's back to 331 megabytes with the 0711 SHA 256 hash. And uh, yeah, that concludes our demonstration of the Runaway Reptar implant that we designed. <laughs> so now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, future research. So for Runaway Reptar, it's cool, or at least I think it's cool. But we want to actually implement a universal jar jacker. Uh, we had intimate knowledge of AccuPOS and its jar file and knew what class to target. But if we took a look at the manifest file, identified the main class for the jar file, and modified its bytecode with a runaway, runaway reptar stub, then we could potentially implement a universal jar jacker. Also, we'd like to upgrade our XOR uh, cryptography scheme to SSL because that's uh, more robust and secure. And lastly, if we implemented a pure uh, Java version of Runaway Reptar, it would be cross-platform. It wouldn't rely on any uh, J JNA stuff or DLLs. What would also be interesting is actually look at the payment terminal hardware itself. Um, can we uh, reverse engineer the protocols um, that are used uh, between the point of interaction device and the terminal? And can we actually leverage this to maybe man in the middle attack or whatnot? Um, also, is uh, memory, are memory corruption bugs a thing on these devices? Uh, that would be interesting to, uh, you know, uh, attack, the hat, attack the stack, attack the heap, and gain, uh, gain some uh, code execution that way. Or uh, are we able to run unsigned code on these devices? And if we're not, can we, can we 
fool the device to uh, fake a signage of the code. So we talked a lot about of, uh, uh, POS malware and attacking POS applications, and this gives, gave us some, uh, this attacker perspective gave us insight into possible indications that could be implemented to fix these things. First thing is code signing and file signature verification. If that was implemented, uh, runaway Reptar wouldn't work. Uh, we shouldn't have the ability, an attacker shouldn't have the ability to run untrusted code as the application. And uh, you know, make sure your applications are running uh, with the least privilege necessary. Um, you know, a few of those demos, we were actually leveraging their privilege, gaining code execution, and getting higher privileges because of that. Next, we want to make sure that uh, excessive file permissions aren't enabled. The fact that any low privilege authenticated user can modify the core application of a terminal uh, is foolish to say the least. And please, don't include hard-coded credentials if you're a dev. Um, even if you try to obfuscate or do whatever, um, it's, you know, a researcher's gonna find that. It's pretty trivial. And, you know, unless you're a PhD in mathematics, don't roll your own crypto. Um, there are plenty of uh, third-party libraries that are vetted to be, to be secure. So some takeaways from this talk, uh, and some takeaways from the research that we did uh, leading up to this talk is, exploits aren't always necessary. For a runaway Reptar, we took advantage of a misconfiguration that could have been avoided, and uh, it was purely a post-exploitation exercise. So exploits are, aren't always necessary to cause damage. And uh, reverse engineering Java is uh, pretty nice um, because you get a uh, source code representation uh, rather than dealing with native binaries and staring at assembly code all day. Also, uh, we found out that credentials in clear text, it's actually a pretty common issue. Uh, for instance, with Possum, we had the credentials that were in a Java binary, but Java is decompilable, and with Amigo, although we didn't know the credentials, they were saved and stored and loaded by a low-priv user. And never trust point-of-sale software with your data. <laughs> so there's a, something called P2PE, or point-to-point -point encryption, which actually encrypts the data at the time of actually swiping your card or entering your chip and entering your PIN, before it even reaches the payment terminal. If this becomes a, a more widespread, then the application doesn't even get a chance to access any a sense of information. And that would, that, you know, no matter how vulnerable the app is, they'll just never get your track data yeah. that way. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, P2P, e, is that also the same thing as an encrypted swipe? Um, What's the difference? So, so it, it encrypts that swipe data right away, right as the swipe happens. Yeah, it actually works. There's an application, or it's application layer on the point of entry or point of interaction device. Uh, depending on the vendor, where it's Verifone or Ingenico, they have an API that the developers can use to encrypt the data at the application layer of that device prior to actually sending it across the wire. Although, in my belief, I think nothing's 100%, so. Yeah, we'll see. We'll wait and see. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, did you uh, use any um, you know, threat detection to see the stuff that you built if it triggered any of the... Uh, it won't. It's, oh. it's, well, the well, thing it's, is, so the data is encrypted. We did use uh, we did use an endpoint such as register and C2. We weren't trying to be uh, stealthy at all because it was a point of uh, a proof of concept. But well, no, I was curious on the, the, the uh, unsafe usage and how you did the main memory scraping. Mm -hmm. I know that there is some you know, threat detection uh, right. around memory scraping and whether or not that method uh, you use would have been... Uh, we haven't checked. If it's a beha behavioral detection, it may possibly. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what I was going on. Yeah. All right. Any... Yes. yes. Is there any more scenario? We have a compromised part of your Windows zero day. Mm -hmm. And your, your privilege is limited. You cannot change the binary because there is signature checks with your server, and you cannot do anything with your binary itself. And the application has been written in .NET framework, which uses our uh, secure strings. Have you worked, on, and you can do your memory scrap. Have you worked on .NET secure strings? Yeah, you can find something in the So we haven't looked at uh, any .NET secure, secure string implementation uh, inside of uh, POS applications. The Amigo POS, which we talked about earlier, was written in .NET, but we didn't see it use any secure strings to like 
uh, hide any of the sensitive information. Well, that is something that we could look into further. To be honest with you, most of the uh, applications we downloaded or looked at were written in Java. Yeah, it's very about 90, 90 plus percent. Yeah, it was very popular among POS applications. Uh, right. So basically, so the key for this is that I can I can Right. Yes. Have you contacted the software vendors and shared your research? We have. Yes, we have. Yes. And uh, what's their timeline for uh, producing an update? <laughs> uh, so most of them didn't really have a, they didn't care. But some of them did respond, and we're in communications with them for updating. Some of the more serious things have been fixed. Yes. But uh, some of them were marked as won't fix, because I guess they don't see it as an issue. But the more serious things were addressed. So for those things that they've identified as won't fix, are you publishing that? Um, no. <laughs> why, yes. why not? Because they've made it clear it's not a problem. Well, we, we disagree. That's why <laughs> not. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so we've already published basically our work on this on our on our blog, and we can um, give everybody information on that uh, at versebright.com, basically. Any uh, additional questions? All right. Well, that concludes our presentation. Thank you for having me.